the old foe, the scariest guys in the playground. They come from a land where meat is king and salad is considered unnecessary. You're watching Distracted Sports put in a massive legal hit on that like button and in the lead up of the upcoming ABS tour of South Africa, let's look at the history of these two mega powers of the game. Now I say mega powers, but life for the All Blacks in the World Champion box has not been smooth sailing of late, but let's go back to happier times. Before I focus on the upcoming games and where both teams are currently at, I just want to talk about a couple of games in the early to mid 90s. They really established for me the special bond between these rugby nations. Now, my first memory of South Africa wasn't all that exciting, although there was a lot of hype around it. I was nine. They'd just come out of their apartheid sporting restrictions and I'd never seen them play. But my dad told me that other than us, they were the best in the world. Now, what do I remember about that game itself? Well, it started with a lot of kicking duels. I remember thinking, what the f***? This is dog's balls. Now, not the most exciting thing I'd ever seen on a rugby field, but in some ways, it set the tone for all the clashes I'd be absorbed in for the years to come. Not the fact that it would be boring, but the fact a single inch would never be given when playing the box. It would always be a grind, and it would never be easy. And when the kicking stopped, it would be the most bruising, physically pulverizing contest where holding your nerve for the full bruising 80 minutes could give you any chance to win. Now, as many of you like to point out in the comments, I and most Kiwi fans are arrogant. Yep, it's true. We go into every game expecting to win. Well, that was true in the past. Currently with this fozzy lead outfit, I feel like if we had an off day, we could be popped off by a fired up Georgian outfit. But despite all our arrogance and unquestionable certainty of success, it was always a little bit different when it came to the box. There's just a certain uneasiness around the encounter, knowing the fact that on their day, they would beat us and they would beat us up. And if both teams had their day, it would be an 80 minute bowel moving roller coaster in which you'd be struggling to keep your heart from bursting out of your chest. Playing South Africa in South Africa has always been the ultimate test for the All Blacks. It's like the challenge I face after trying to pass a bowel movement after going to a South African friend's bride. I'm so plugged up with the meat, the eventual cuck is so ridiculously hard, it could cut diamonds. Did, did I just overshare? Now, going back to that game in 92, it's pretty odd seeing the amount of old South African flags in the crowd. And it serves as a bit of a reminder as to how far the nation had come when you do a short jump three years into the future to see the same two teams playing in the same stadium, not a single old flag in sight. And seeing the most courageous international leader of my life, and who only a few short years earlier had been locked up for 27 years as a criminal for fighting for his rights and the rights of his people now being adored and cheered for the true South African hero he was. It's amazing stuff. Now the game itself was as tense as a pig in a bacon factory, with the teams exchanging penalties throughout. The late great John Lomu was well contained and unable to recreate the pulverizing form he had throughout the rest of the tournament. For the record, I do think this is the best ever tackle made on the big man by the late great Jus van der Verstehen. In the end, through two periods of halftime, Joel Stransky with stones the size of Kruger National Park slotted the drop coal, with it, and the box with a stadium of 43 million South Africans behind them held on for the famous win. In my lounge, where my family and I were watching, there was silence. This may sound a bit over the top, but I've been in the room where people have passed away, and on that Sunday morning in 1995, it really did feel a bit like that. Now, I'm not afraid to admit it, but as a 12 year old watching just out of sheer disappointment, I did get a little bit teary. And I remember looking at my mum and there were tears in her eyes too, but not like mine. She was watching the South African people, black, white and brown. They were all cheering together with unbridled joy. And Nelson Mantella's smile was so warm and wide, it was almost bursting through the screen. I remember her saying under her breath, this is incredible. For her whole life, South Africa had been under apartheid, and now she was watching a sight that was barely imaginable in her entire life, let alone when we played them just three short years earlier. She turned to me smiling, with tears still streaming out of her eyes, and said, It's okay. It had to be this way. Now I was very young, and I thought, F*** that, Mum, this sucks all this shit! But in hindsight, Mum was right. 
Mums are usually right. It did have to be that way. And in some weird way, I'm kind of proud that my little nation in the middle of the South Pacific had anything to do with such a historic moment for the great nation of South Africa. Now, back to the rugby. Only one year later, the All Blacks were embarking on their greatest challenge, to be the first All Black team to win a series in South Africa. The ABs won game one, but game two is the one I want to focus on. It was in Alice Park, and all the Biltong and Pavlova was on the line, and the start was frenetic. Both teams had everything to play for, but the box struck first. The incredible pace didn't stop. Watching it now makes me think that all the players took speed before the game. Either that or they just got hyped by listening to Darude Sandstorm in the sheds. I've just watched the whole game. Even though it happened 25 years ago, my butt was puckered and my heart was racing. Which is far better than your heart puckering and your butt racing. The All Blacks were brilliant in so many ways, but the sheer will and bloody mindedness of the box not to be the first team to lose a series against the All Blacks at home was something to behold. This is in 96, when they were clearly the two best teams in the world. It was really the very definition of an unstoppable force, meaning an unmovable object. Oh, look at that chip and chase from Goldie. Shit, that is as tasty as a steak and cheese pie after you've pretended to be a vegan for a hot chick on a first date. Now, Jeff Olsen may be a bit of a spin doctor for the NZR on Sky Sport, but you can't forget, by God he was a class player. Juice van der was massive in this game as well, and the rest of the Bok pack were just giants. Special mention has to go for John Preston. He was the beaver before the beaver. He came on for the third choice, first five, Simon Culhane, in the second half after the Box had scored two quick tries and got two monster penalties. The Box just wouldn't go away. The sheer physical toll on the players in this game, which was played at an incredible pace throughout, is probably the most bruising encounter I've ever seen in my life. And here you can see in the final whistle the complete and utter exhaustion is written all over the players. And the real sense of achievement for the All Blacks is the height of these great players' careers. At the time of accomplishing this monster piece of history against our greatest foe, it was seen as really our greatest achievement in the history of rugby. Such is the esteem we hold for the Springbok jersey. But let's fast forward to more recent times to get an idea of where these two proud nations are currently at. After winning the World Cup in 2019, South Africa should have had that lovely afterglow period to bask in their success in 2020, but a certain prick of a virus unfortunately prevented that from happening. And the world champions just they couldn't play a single game in 2020. Since then, they've undergone massive changes, their franchises leaving Super Rugby for Europe, and they also bet a Lions outfit 2-1 in front of zero screaming fans. Russi Erasmus went to the diary room of Big Brother and overshared. They then lost twice to the Crims across the ditch, which would have gone down like a ball war stuffed with manure for the locals back home. They went on to lose a game to the ABs to get one back, and a couple of games that just didn't feel right being played on neutral soil in Australia. And then in November, won two of their three games, losing the final game to the private schoolboys of England. Now, on paper, this doesn't sound like it's too bad, but for a world champion Brock team, it's not that great, really. Now, finally, things start to get back to normal this year, and it was a thing of real beauty to see the Box playing in front of their adoring faithful. Now, to be honest, I really didn't think the Box really got their mojo back until the final test. Losing at home to Wales may have given them the kick in the ass they needed to look like the old South African team. But all in all, in my opinion, they still have a huge amount to prove going into the rugby championship. And who have they got first? None other than the mighty All Blacks. Now let's be honest, they really aren't that mighty right now. They've just lost a series at home for the first time in the modern era. They've lost four of the last five games, and they've lost a whole host of other records under Fuzzy. They just dumped two of their scapegoats, I mean coaches. Their backs have had the precision of teenage versions trying to have sex for the first time, and their forwards were as solid as a baby boomer trying to get a non-pharmaceutically induced erection. They've brought in Jason Ryan as forwards coach, who has had amazing success as assistant to the man who should be the All Blacks coach, Ray Robinson. And he's had a few stand-ups with the press, and he seems like he's a straight shooter. And when he speaks, he just can't help but listen and, and follow, I'd imagine. As opposed to Ian Foster, who, when he speaks, you can't help but think if you're due for a prostate check. 
Steve Hansen has publicly said that the board and the exec of New Zealand Rugby is as, as shit as it's ever been. So it's all a bit of a dumpster fire. The All Blacks are now needing to win like no other time in their recent history. You'd have to go back to 98 to see a record that would be comparable. But for the here and now, the public is demanding success like never before. Careers are on the line. And who do we have up next? It's none other than the greatest challenge for any All Black team, whether they're in form or not. It's South Africa. In South Africa. The old foe. Now, with all my blathering, the end point is the pressure is massive on both of these proud nations. Losing is not an option for either. Now, I know times have changed, but if you look back at that great test in 96, the ingredients were the same. Neither team could contemplate losing and left every ounce of energy they had on the park. If the same thing happens over the next two tests between these two teams, whose rivalry has had as much to do as anything else with defining who they are, we're in for a real treat. As an All Blacks fan, it doesn't get much better than this. But we better bloody win. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. Please like and subscribe. If you really enjoyed this, you can head over to my um, Patreon page and, and, and see what happens over there. Uh, who knows? Uh, also, go follow me on Twitter, at Tones88. That would be great too. Uh, yeah, so much love to all of you. Mwah!